Good morning, friends. Uh, let me remind you that after service this morning, we're going to go over to Deep Creek Baptist Church, and we, we're going to have a baptism service there. We invite all of you to join us. If you don't know how to get to Deep Creek Baptist Church, just find somebody that does and follow them. It's about uh, eight or ten minutes from here. Also, on November the 3rd, we're going to have a Reformation Day Festival. Uh, so put that on your calendar. Invite somebody who is unchurched and, and come out here and eat some chili and learn about John Bunyan and hear the gospel. Okay? Matt, where are you? Come read Call to Worship. Thank you. Good morning. I'll be reading Psalm 40, verse 135. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, and making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will pro proclaim and tell of them Yet they are more than I can be. They are more than can be told. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for salvation, the hope, hope of salvation, Lord, the forgiveness of sins that comes through Him. We're thankful that that we can be pulled up from the muck and the mire. We can we can have our sins forgiven. We can be put on a solid rock, Lord. We're thankful for these things that you, you provide to those of us who put our hope and our trust in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us the ability to share this hope and share this forgiveness with others, Lord. Um, just give us the boldness to be able to do that. We're thankful this morning for, for Benny and for Lisa, Lord, and, and their obedience uh, to Christ, Lord, and their willingness to, to want to serve him. I'm thankful that you have convicted them, that you've made them aware that they're sinners in need of salvation, Lord. And I pray that you would use them for your glory. You do a great work in them and through them, that you would help us as a church to encourage them in all that they do. Uh, we're thankful for all these who have come out this, this morning, Lord. I pray that you would bless them through the reading and the hearing of your word and the songs that we sing. We pray this service will glorify you in all ways. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> Okay, three weeks ago we tried to sing this song, A Mighty Fortress, and if you'll remember, it's a little weird. Comes in on the offbeat. So it's going to feel like you're singing in the wrong place the whole time, but it's actually the right place, so let's stand and sing.
Bear with me while I find my place here. I'll be reading in Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. <clears throat> it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we look to your Son, Christ, this morning for our salvation, our sanctification, our redemption, Father, for he is that, him alone, Father. We thank you for your mercy, and we look to you this morning, God, for, for, for you to extend that to us and our neighbors and those who are still affected, Father, by the hurricane that came through that, that needs you more than ever, God. And, Father, we just thank you for the grace that you have extended to us. And we ask, God, that you would be with the service this morning, that you would bless Brent in the preaching of the gospel, and that we would magnify Christ and make much of him. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand again and sing.
a new song now. It's uh, entitled Rise My Soul, The Lord Is Risen. It's actually pretty easy to sing. <clears throat> copy of the scriptures to the gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4.
Let's pray. Our Father, we're glad to be here uh, with your people and to have a copy of your word. And we want to ask that you'd open up our hearts, Holy Spirit, so that we might hear and receive truth in our inner being. We pray, Father, that this would not just be um, something that stops at our ears, uh, this piece of scripture, but it, that it goes all the way down to our heart and changes us uh, at a constitutional level. Uh, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is our sinless Savior. He is our righteousness. Uh, he is the one who bled and died in our place to atone for our sin. He is the one who rose from the dead. And he is the one who is coming again uh, to bring those who trust in him into glory. We pray, Father, that you would increase our faith this morning. We pray that you would continue to build your church. Uh, we pray that you would continue uh, to weed out people uh, from this church whose uh, hearts are not right and never will be right, and that you would continue to bring those who are your sheep and who you are making your sheep. Continue to protect and build your church. I pray for myself. Uh, please forgive me of the multitude of my sins. Uh, Lord, I'm just a sinner. I'm weak. I'm needy. I'm foolish. Uh, I'm prone to do the wrong thing. And I pray, Father, that by your spirit you give me uh, the power to preach now. I pray that by the blood of Jesus you would forgive me even now. And I ask, Lord, that you'd help me uh, to preach to please Christ and Christ alone. We pray, Father, that you give us a supernatural ability to pay attention to what's being said and to profit from it. Uh, we thank you for your love and kindness and tender mercies in our lives that have preserved us through this previous week. And, Lord, even as we come to this text of Scripture, we want to confess that our hope is in you. Uh, we want to ask that you forgive us that our hope is so weak and ask that you would increase our hope today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully you've made your way to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. <clears throat> then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So we're going to attempt to do something very difficult this morning which is to preach part two of a sermon that was preached three weeks ago, okay? <laughs> so uh, we preached the first half of this text three Sundays ago. And so by way of refresher, if you will remember three Sundays ago, we were asking the question, what can we learn from the wilderness temptation of Jesus? And three Sundays ago, we had four answers to that question. The first one was this. Uh, we learned that Jesus resisted the devil by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we all know that Jesus is fully God. We also know that he's fully man. And when we see Jesus resisting all of Satan tem Satan's temptations, uh, what we are prone to think is, well, Jesus was able to do that because he was God. But Jesus did not pull out the God card and trump all of Satan's temptations. He resisted every temptation by the power of the Holy Spirit as a man just like you and just like me. Also, we learned three weeks ago, number two, that the Holy Spirit leads us into difficult circumstances. Look at uh, verse 1. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness for what purpose? 
to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So the Holy Spirit will lead us as God's people into difficult circumstances. Uh, Spirit-filled people don't live easy, cushy, placid lives. Uh, God gives us his spirit so that we can do battle with a snake. So that we can enter into a spiritual war zone. That's what happened in Christ's life. That's what will happen in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, three weeks ago, the third thing we learned was this. Uh, Satan will tempt you and I to trust in bread rather than the giver of bread. Satan will tempt us to trust in bread rather than the giver of bread. Satan came to the Lord Jesus and said, If you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And the temptation was what? Use your God powers to get what you want now instead of trusting your Father to give you what you need when you need it. And the fourth thing we learned three Sundays ago was this. Satan will tempt you and I to put God to the test. Uh, Satan's second temptation of the Lord Jesus was this. Jesus, why don't you jump off the pinnacle of the temple? It says here in the book of Psalms, uh, that your father will send angels to bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Why don't you jump off right now and make God prove that he's with you? And so we learned last Sunday that God has the right to test our character, but we don't ever have the right to test his. Why? He's already proven his character to us by sending his one and only son to live the life we could not live, to die the death we deserve, and to rise from the dead for our salvation. He doesn't have anything left to prove to us, so we should never put God to the test. So let's continue on this morning with three more answers to this question. What can we learn from the temptation of Jesus? Answer number five. Satan will tempt you to make peace with sin in exchange for instant gratification. Satan will tempt you to make peace with sin in exchange for instant gratification. Look at verse 8 and 9 of Matthew chapter 4. It says again, The devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And the devil said to Jesus, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So this must have been some kind of visionary experience that the devil brought Jesus into. Why do I say that? Well, there's no mountain on the planet from which you can see all the kingdoms of the world. If you were on Mount Everest itself, you could not see all the kingdoms of the world. So this must have been some kind of visionary temptation that Satan brought to Jesus to tempt Christ with. In this third temptation, you know, Satan's been kind of seductive in the first two. Uh, in this third temptation, he just abandons all guile. And he says, if you will get down on your knees and worship me right now, I'll give you the world and everything in it. Now, uh, 14 centuries earlier, 14 centuries prior to Matthew chapter 4, the nation of Israel had wandered in the desert after they came up out of Egyptian slavery. And during that time, Satan likewise tempted them, the nation of Israel, to idolatrous worship. Do you remember this? Uh, Moses went up on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus to receive the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. And what happened? He stayed up there too long. And all the people said, this guy's never coming back. What's he doing? He's up there too long. Aaron, tell everybody to gather up all the, the, the nose rings and the earrings, put them in this pot. We'll melt them down. And you, Aaron, make us gods to go before us. We don't know what happened to this Moses guy. Listen to Exodus 32.4. <coughs> it says, and he, he being Aaron while Moses is on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. And he, Aaron, received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So in the desert, Old Testament Israel was tempted to the idolatry of worshiping a golden calf. In a similar way, right here in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is in the desert, in the wilderness, being tempted to the idolatrous worship of Satan himself. The devil is tempting Jesus to make peace with sin in exchange for the instant gratification of the kingdoms of the earth and all their glory. It's the same kind of temptation that Israel experienced in the wilderness 14 centuries earlier. And church, the devil tempts us in the exact same way, does he not? He tempts us to compromise. He tempts you and I to make peace with sin. 
He tempts us to sell our soul for instant gratification. He tempts us to trade our eternity for a few short years of earthly comfort and power and pleasure and prestige. Do you remember there in the Old Testament when Joshua led the people into the promised land and uh, they were to destroy the Canaanites? And the first city they came against was Jericho. And they overthrew Jericho. And, and God told them clearly, don't take any of the spoil for yourself. Well, Satan came to an Israel, Israelite named Achan. And he offered Achan 100 shekels of gold, 50 shekels of silver, and a fine Babylonian garment in exchange for his soul. And what did Achan do? He took the devil up on the offer. Achan sold his soul for a handful of money and some nice clothes. Instant gratification if you will make peace with sin and compromise. Uh, if you remember there in the New Testament, Judas Iscariot, what did he sell his soul for? He sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. He sold out the Lord Jesus Christ for a little handful of money for the instant gratification that money can bring. Jesus, here in Matthew chapter 4, is experiencing this same kind of temptation. Well, why do people make peace with sin and embrace wicked lifestyles? Why do people do this? It's not for no reason, is it? People make peace with sin. People embrace wicked lifestyles because in the short term, sin is extremely rewarding. Did you hear me? In the short term, sin is always extremely rewarding. From a short-term perspective, from a this-worldly perspective, sin pays great dividends. There's a lot of money, and there's a lot of pleasure to be had through pornography and through pedophilia and through prostitution. That's why people get into it. There's money and pleasure in it. There's a lot of money and comfort to be gained from shady business deals, is there not? There's a lot of money and power and prestige to be had if you will just cave into the pressure of pop culture and go along with their stupidity and lies. It's lucrative in the short run. People don't make peace with sin for nothing. They make peace with sin because it yields a quick reward and it yields an enticing reward. Listen, if somebody offered you all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory... That's no small thing, is it? However, the benefit package that comes from making peace with sin is always short-lived. The longest it can ever last is your last breath in this world. When this life is over, all that you or I might gain from making peace with sin will be stripped from our cold, dead hands. But the benefit package that comes from being devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ and from refusing to make peace with sin lasts forever, and it is a better benefit package. Well, we see here in Matthew chapter 4 that Satan took Jesus up onto a high mountain and offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory. Uh, really, this is the most enticing offer ever made to a human being. This is the ultimate bait for instant gratification. Uh, Satan here in Matthew chapter 4 does not merely offer Jesus something. He offers Jesus everything. You can have it all. And Jesus, you can have it all bypassing all the suffering and all the shame of the cross. Man, what an offer. That would have been very, very tempting. Yet Jesus resists this unbelievably enticing offer by quoting and obeying Deuteronomy 6.13. Look at, look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10 where Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.13. It says, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, and, and here's Deuteronomy 6.13, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So Jesus could have had it all, no shame, no suffering, no cross, no people spitting in your face, no crown of thorns, no nails through the wrists and feet. He could have had it all right there, instant gratification. But Jesus refused to make peace with sin, and he did the Father's will. He endured the cross. He endured the hardship all the way to the point of death and the grave. Because Jesus refused to make peace with sin... He eventually wound up with everything that Satan was offering him right here in chapter 4. Anyhow, 
After Christ rose from the dead, we read this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 and 18. This is after Jesus has been raised from the dead, okay? It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain. To the mountain. Where in Matthew chapter 4 is Satan tempting Jesus with all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory? On a high mountain, okay? At the end of Matthew's gospel, after Christ had been raised from the dead, he sends his disciples up to another mountain, okay? To the mountain which Jesus directed them. In verse 18, it says this, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go make disciples of all nations. In other words, everything that Satan offered Jesus right here in Matthew chapter 4, all the kingdoms of the earth and their glory, God gave to his son in the end and then some on a high mountain. And my point is this. There is nothing that Satan offers you in terms of instant gratification in this world today that God will not eventually give you if you will trust and follow his son. And he won't just give it to you for a short time. He'll give it to you forever. Do you believe that? Your life will show it. The decisions you make will show and prove whether you believe that or not. So let me ask this question to each of you this morning. Where are you personally tempted to make peace with sin for the sake of money or power or prestige or pleasure or comfort? Uh, where do you need to adjust your time horizon and your perspective on things? As Christian people, we do confess that in the short run, sin pays excellent dividends. But obeying Christ by faith pays better dividends and eternal dividends in that life and that world which is to come, which lasts forever. Uh, so, brothers, sisters, do not be like Esau. Don't sell your birthright for a mess of pottage. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 26. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? And of course, from an eternal perspective, the answer is absolutely nothing. Church, we cannot remain in the faith if our mindset is geared toward instant gratification in this life. We have to have the mind of the Spirit, and the mind of the Spirit is a mind set on delayed gratification and greater gratification given to us by Christ in the world to come forever. Is that your mindset? Do you have to have it and have it now, or can you trust Christ to give you more and better later? Well, what can we learn from the temptation of Jesus? Number five, Satan will tempt you to make peace with sin in exchange for instant gratification. Number six, number six, Jesus was faithful where we have been unfaithful. Jesus was faithful where we have been unfaithful. So three times Jesus stands strong against the tempter and refuses to cave in to sin. Three times the Holy Spirit brings Scripture to Jesus' mind, and three times Jesus obeys that Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sure that most of you who have been Christians for any length of time have heard a preacher preach on this passage. And what is the main lesson that said preacher brought out of the passage? That this passage is designed to teach us that if you want to overcome sin, you have to know and quote Scripture. Well, that's all fine and that's all good, but that's not what this passage is mainly trying to teach us. Yes, it's good to know Scripture, and yes, knowing Scripture and meditating on Scripture will help you in the battle against sin, but that is not the main point of this passage. Let's think again about what has happened in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Jesus has been led out into the wilderness by the Spirit for 40 days. Old Testament Israel came out of Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Okay, this is no coincidence, okay? In the first temptation, Jesus was tempted to rely on his own ability to turn stones into bread. Old Testament Israel was tempted in the same way, to gather all the manna they could every morning and store it up for tomorrow. And God said, don't you do that. You trust me to give it to you again the next day. 
See the parallel in the temptations that Old Testament Israel experienced and Jesus is experiencing here in Matthew chapter 4? Uh, think about the second temptation of Jesus here in this passage. He was tempted to put God to the test by jumping from the pinnacle of the temple and forcing God the Father to prove that he was with Jesus, that he would save Jesus. 1,400 years earlier, Old Testament Israel put God to the test in the wilderness by saying, we're thirsty, prove you're with us by providing water right now. God's already brought the ten plagues. God's already parted the Red Sea. They said, prove it now, prove you're with us. We want water, we want it now. You see the parallel between how Jesus is being tempted in Matthew 4 and how Old Testament Israel was tempted when they wandered in the desert. Uh, third temptation, Jesus was tempted to worship Satan in exchange for all the kingdoms of the world. Old Testament Israel, when they wandered in the desert, was tempted to worship a golden calf. And what did they do while they were worshiping the golden calf? It says they basically had an orgy. They had a party around the golden calf. They had the things that this world offered. Notice also, yes, Jesus quotes three pieces of Scripture. But they are not willy-nilly from all over the Old Testament. All three pieces of Scripture come from only two chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. All three of his quotations come from either Deuteronomy chapter 6 or Deuteronomy chapter 8. And this is no coincidence either. You see, Deuteronomy is a book where Moses is speaking to a new generation of Israelites who are about to go into the promised land. They've been wandering around for 40 years in the desert waiting for their parents to die because of their parents' unbelief and refusal to go in and take the promised land and believe that God would give it to them. And Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, is telling a new generation what they have to do to avoid the failures of their parents, that sinful generation that preceded them and died in the wilderness. And that's where all of Jesus' Scripture quotations come from, where Moses in Deuteronomy is telling people how to take the land and to have success and to not fail like their parents did before them. And the point of all these parallels between the experience of Jesus and the experience of Old Testament Israel is this. Where God's son Israel failed and sinned, God's greater son Jesus succeeded and never sinned. That's the point of the first 11 verses of Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is the true son of God. He is the true Israel. Jesus was faithful in every way that Israel had been unfaithful. Church, Jesus has been faithful in every way that you and I have been unfaithful. In every way that God's people have failed, the Lord Jesus has succeeded. In every place where God's people have fallen and succumbed to temptation, Jesus has resisted that same kind of temptation. In every way that you and I have been overcome by Satan and by evil, Jesus has stood strong against Satan and against evil. That's the point of this passage, the main point. Church, you and I, we sin and we fail every single day of our lives. Jesus never failed. Jesus never sinned. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. That's the point of the wilderness temptation. Why is it such good news that Jesus never sinned, that he never failed, that he's always been faithful where you and I have been unfaithful? Uh, what's that supposed to do for us when we acknowledge Jesus is perfect and we're a mess? Are we just supposed to feel guilty about that? Or, or, or is there some good news in it? Well, friends, there's a lot of good news in it because since Jesus never sinned, he had no sin of his own to pay for. And therefore, he could hang on the cross of Calvary and bleed and suffer and die and bear the wrath of God for the sins of others, for my sins and for your sins. Yes, it's good news that Jesus never sinned. Because if he had, he couldn't have paid for my sin. But he didn't, and he paid for my sin, and he paid for your sin, church. But that's not all. Since Jesus never sinned, he has a perfect righteousness to credit to every single person who trusts in him. If you're hoping faith or in the Christ of Scripture, then the perfect, sinless righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ has been reckoned to you, imputed to you, credited to you through your union by faith with him. 
And though you and I, church, be sinners today, every day we sin in practice, at the same time in the courtroom of God, we are counted righteous on account of the perfect righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, it's good news that Jesus never sinned. When you open the book in heaven and see my name there, Christ's record is written under it. That's how I'm getting into heaven. That's how you're getting into heaven, brothers and sisters. This is uh, what theologians refer to as the great exchange. The sin of the Son of God took all of our sin onto himself. And he clothes us in his righteousness when we believe. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Paul writes, For our sake he, he would be God the Father, made him... Him would be Jesus. For our sake, God the Father made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. You're looking at somebody who has the righteousness of God. I blow it every day. My, my family knows that in practice, I am nothing like the righteousness of God. But by faith in Jesus Christ, I have the righteousness of God in the courtroom of heaven. The sinless Son of God took all our sin and shame on Himself. He suffered, He bled, He died, He paid the price in full, and He clothes us in His sinless righteousness in the sight of God. So our sin was imputed to Him at the cross. His righteousness is imputed to us when we believe. It's as if we're standing there wearing this cloak that is covered in grease and grime, and mud, and filth, and feces, and here is Jesus, and he has a cloak on that is snow white and beautiful, not a speck of anything on it, and when we trust in him, he swaps with us. This is the gospel. Do you, do you believe that today? Uh, why will I, Brent Stewart, not be consigned to eternal death when I stand before the holy judge of all the earth? God's holy. He cannot countenance sin. I was born a sinner. I have sinned every single day of my life. How will I ever get into heaven? Oh, well, you're a preacher, Brent. Well, who cares? If you took my best five days preaching and that's all I'd ever done, I'd go straight to hell. There's enough sin in my best five days of being a pastor to take me to hell. I will make it to heaven because the death of Jesus stands good for me. Well, how will a sinner like me ever be good enough to enter heaven? The life of Jesus stands good for me. It's good news, isn't it? Do you believe it today? Is your hope, your faith, your trust, your confidence in the true Israel, the true Son of God, the one who never buckled under the pressure of temptation? Do you believe the gospel today? Jesus Christ never sinned. Church, we are united to the sinless Son of God by faith. We're in a faith union with Him. And because we are united to the righteous one, we are counted righteous in God's sight. Listen to Romans 3, verse 21 and 22. <clears throat> Paul writes, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested. We might, we might say it's been made available apart from the law apart from your performance and my performance, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Amen. If you trust in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God has been imputed to you. It has been credited to you. The very righteousness that we see Jesus living out right here, resisting every temptation of the devil in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. What righteousness of God are you talking about? I'm talking about the righteousness of God you see in Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. That's yours by faith. His perfect life is yours in the courtroom of heaven. Hmm. You know, I have a T-shirt uh, that has a Latin phrase written on it, and the phrase is simul justus et peccator. It means simultaneously justified and a sinner. In other words, though we sin every single day, church, we are still counted righteous in the courtroom of God on account of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
Brothers, sisters, we are going to heaven to live forever in the perfect presence and the perfect joy of our perfectly holy God, not because we are perfect people, but because Jesus never sinned and we have been counted perfectly righteous in him. Hallelujah. Praise God for his sinless son. Praise God for the Lord Jesus Christ who went through all this in the desert for us and went all the way through 33 years of life in this world without sinning and went all the way to the cross and all the way down into the tomb and never sinned so that we could be counted righteous. Praise God for the gospel. Well, what can we learn from the temptation of Jesus? Number five this morning was that Satan will tempt you to make peace with sin in exchange for instant gratification. Number six, Jesus was faithful where we have been unfaithful. And number seven, and finally, is this. Jesus sympathizes with those who are being tempted. Jesus sympathizes with those who are being tempted. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11, please. Then the devil left <clears throat> Jesus, and behold, angels came <clears throat> and were ministering to him. So after 40 days in the wilderness alone, after 40 days without food, after 40 days of enduring the assaults and the temptations of the devil himself, it says the devil left, and it says angels came and were ministering to Jesus. Why? Why? Because all the stress and the strain of all these satanic attacks had brought Jesus to the end of his strength. He was spent. He was spent because he endured the full force of Satan's temptation and testing. I mean, you can just imagine Jesus laying there in the desert. He doesn't even have enough strength to lift his head up. He's at the point of death from all that he's endured through the tempting of the evil one. Now, here's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, nobody in this room, indeed, nobody on planet Earth knows what it's like to endure the full force of Satan's tempting power. You ever think about that? You don't know what it's like. Nobody on this planet knows what it's like to endure the full force of Satan's tempting power. Why? Because before it ever gets to its maximum tempting power, we always give in. Jesus didn't give in. So he felt the full force and fury of the tempter's snares. He never yielded to sin. So he experienced the power of temptation to the uttermost. We don't experience it to the uttermost because when it starts getting hard, we buckle. Jesus never buckled. He experienced all the power of temptation. Jesus is the only man who has ever lived who knows what it feels like to experience the full force and power of demonic and satanic testing. Jesus has experienced more of the power and strain of temptation than anybody who has ever lived at any point in history because he resisted it to its maximum force and then overcame that power of temptation. And that's why in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 4, we see him just wiped out. He's laying on the ground. Angels come and nurse him back to health and minister to him. He has borne the full onslaught of hell itself. You know, my oldest daughter started college at Western earlier uh, this fall, and she's homeschooled. And so a lot of times she comes home and, and, and she just falls down on the couch because she's been around people. <laughs> and a lot of them are weird. And, and she has all this social anxiety, and, 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 and she's tired just from being around strange people all day. And, you know, I sympathize with her because if you put me around strange people all day, I, I get tired too. I, I felt it. I, I've been there, and I've, I've done that. Uh, some of you, you men, have got up here behind this pulpit and you've tried to preach a few times. You sympathize with me right now. The rest of you really can't sympathize because you've never been there and done that. In the world of sound waves and acoustics, uh, there's a phenomenon called sympathetic resonance. Sympathetic resonance. And, and the classic example of sympathetic resonance, or you might call it sympathetic vibration, is if you, if you have two tuning forks uh, and they're tuned similarly and you strike one of them and you bring it over near the other one, this one will start to vibrate, even if you don't touch it with the first tuning fork. That's called sympathetic resonance. Uh, 
In the same way, the Bible tells us that the heart of Jesus sympathetically resonates with our temptations. Jesus is a high priest who is able to sympathize with our temptations because he himself has felt and experienced the power of temptation to the full when he walked this earth as a man. Church, because Jesus has endured the full force of satanic temptation, because Jesus has been tempted in every way that we are, and then some, he sympathizes with you and me in all of our trials and all of our temptations. Listen to Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to experience the strain and the stress and the pressure and the power of temptation, and he knows it even more and even better than anybody in this room does. He never gave in. He experienced temptation to the max. Church, when you and I are being tempted to sin, Jesus is not up in heaven looking at us with a frown and a a scolding type face and saying, tisk, tisk, I can't believe you're thinking about doing that. Because he's been there and he knows how hard it is. He's not disappointed in us, church, when we experience temptation. When we're tempted and tried and beset by the world and our own flesh and the devil himself, Jesus is doing what? He's sympathizing with us. Church, that's what Hebrews 4.15 says. When you're tempted to sin, Jesus is sympathetic towards you. Church, when sin comes knocking at the door of your heart and at the door of your mind, Jesus is moved with compassion and sympathy and concern for you and for me because he walked this earth as a man and he has felt and done all that to the max. He knows what it's like to be tempted. So church, when you and I experience temptation, what typically happens to our relationship with Jesus Christ? We think, oh, I'm being tempted to say, do, or think something that I shouldn't do. I better step back away from Jesus. (laughs) I better get really far away from Jesus. He's holy. I'm I'm thinking about sinning here. I'm being tempted. That's what we do, is it not? The Bible says that is the very opposite of what you ought to do. And that the more you step in that direction, the more you'll sin. Listen to what the Bible says we ought to be doing. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. It says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near. Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So church, brothers, sisters, when sin and temptation comes knocking at your door, you should never draw back from Jesus. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to temptation. It is not a sin to be tempted. You should instead draw near to Jesus because he has compassion for and sympathy for those who are being tempted. He has felt the power of temptation himself. And so his heart goes out to us. His heart is soft and warm and compassionate to us when we're tempted with sin. He wants us to draw near to him in the midst of temptation so that he can give us the grace and the mercy that we need to overcome that temptation. It is no sin to be tempted with evil. Jesus himself was tempted by evil throughout his life, and yet he never sinned. We'll be tempted too. When when we are beset with temptations, the heart of Jesus is moved with compassion. And so we need to view times of temptation and testing as opportunities to draw extremely close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, When you feel the strong temptation to sin... That is a time when you can have more intimacy and closeness with the Lord Jesus than any other time because his heart is sympathetic toward you. You should draw near to him and ask him to help you not sin. 
W what if you thought about your times of temptation in that way instead of this? I've got to get away from Jesus. He's holy and I'm feeling like doing something I ought not do. How would that change your life and my life? Listen to Hebrews 2.18. <clears throat> it says, because Jesus himself has suffered when tempted. Jesus suffered when tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Church, we have a mighty friend in heaven whose heart goes out to us in all of our temptations and trials. We have a mighty Savior who has suffered the strain of temptation himself. We have a great high priest who is ready, willing, and able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus always stands ready to enter into the battle against temptation with his people when we draw near to him and call on him for help instead of shrinking back and feeling like he's disappointed in us because we're being tempted. Beloved, how would your life change if you began to view temptation as a place where the Lord Jesus Christ was ready, willing, and able to meet with you with great compassion and great sympathy and great help? What if you viewed times of temptation where you're tempted to sin as a time when Jesus really wants to get close to you and help you? When we feel like the power and allure of sin is more than we can bear and we're ready to give in, you should run straight to Jesus. And let me tell you something. If you do, and if you genuinely do not want to sin, and you genuinely ask him for mercy and grace to help in time of need, you will not sin. He will help you. So often my problem is this. I really don't want to resist the temptation. But if you want to and you come to our sympathetic, compassionate high priest who has experienced temptation just like me and you, he will help you. He will give you the strength. I'm not saying it'll be easy, but I'm saying he will help you to stand against temptation. Well, praise God that Jesus never sold out for the instant gratification that sin offers. And praise God that every single place where you and I have been unfaithful, Jesus has been faithful. And praise God that Jesus sympathizes with us and is there to help us and to love us and to give us strength whenever and wherever we are tempted and tested. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> who stepped down from his throne in heaven, took on flesh, became a man, lived in a nowhere town called Nazareth, uh, subjected himself to the assaults of Satan, the insults of people, the grit and grime of this sinful fallen world, went all the way to the cross to bear our sin, went down into the grave and rose again for our justification, our vindication. We thank you for Jesus. What an excellent excellent Savior he is. Please help us, Father, to draw near to him, to find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. Help us, Lord, to believe these things that we've seen and been shown here in Matthew chapter 4, not just this morning, uh, but tomorrow and the next day and throughout the rest of our lives. Uh, use this piece of Scripture to make us godlier people. Use this piece of Scripture to increase our faith. And use this Scripture to cause our hearts to love and cling to Jesus more and more. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Ivy's going to play a couple of verses of uh, music, and you go to the Lord in prayer and prepare your heart to take communion.
me remind you as always that the Lord's table is for baptized believers in Jesus Christ. So if you are committed to Christ as your king, if you're relying on Christ to take away the guilt of your sin and be your righteousness and you have been baptized, then you are free to partake of this meal. If that does not describe you, then do not partake of this meal. Wait until you have repented and believed and been baptized and then you may partake. Uh, the Lord's table is for saved sinners. Uh, which is what all Christians are. Every Christian is a saved sinner. Uh, but if you're harboring some kind of unrepentant sin in your heart, we ask that you would do business with the Lord before you partake of these elements. When you're ready, you may come. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing, Rise, my soul, the Lord is risen. <clears throat>
we're going to do is we're going to Deep Creek Baptist Church and we're going to have a baptism. So as I said earlier, if you do not know where Deep Creek Baptist Church is, most everybody in here does. Find somebody to follow. It's only about eight or a ten minute drive and we will see you there. You're at liberty to go.